regret this. Okay, the it's the second annual uh, Cinemasochist Halloween special. Now, I wanted to take a new direction with this one, not do the same thing I did uh, last year. Other than being outdoors, last year I covered one movie that I felt uh, epitomized the overall feel that the Halloween season has. Uh, this year I decided to do 10 of my favorite 80s horror films to watch over the Halloween season that always seem to put me in the right spirits. And if you're watching this on Halloween or before, congratulations to me because I actually managed to post this before Christmas. My Bloody Valentine's always been one of my favorites. I discovered this one way back in the video store days, the Rogers Video Store, Blockbuster, Mom and Pop, Videomatica days. It was one of the first slasher films I saw that wasn't a Friday the 13th, a Halloween, a Nightmare on Elm Street, a Leatherface, and I really liked it. And uh, what I thought was cool is that it was a, a Canadian horror film, and I found it to be quite a bit more gory than a lot of the American mainstream ones were. Like, you got some really grisly kills in that one. It's got a really great atmosphere, especially in the mine. Uh, the mine was a real a real mine, which is why it looks so spooky and dark and creepy. Uh, I felt really added to the atmosphere of it. Harry Warden, to me, is up there as a slasher icon. I think he's just as cool and just as badass and imposing as the likes of Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees. His lore is interesting. The fact that he's this uh, old coal miner that was trapped in a mine due to the, the management not checking the, I think it was like the gas pressure levels or something, so there's an explosion down there, and all the miners get stuck, and the one survivor, Harry Warden, has to basically eat his friends to survive, gets sent to an asylum, then comes back to the town of, uh, I think it was Valentine Bluffs or something, um, and has to, well, doesn't have to, but decides to get revenge uh, on the people that fucked him over, and goes on a massive killing spree, and due to that killing spree, they cancel Valentine's Day forever, so... It might be a film about Valentine's Day, but it's great to watch on Halloween. Maniac. William Lustig classic. Probably one of the movies that make you think of William Lustig to begin with, um, if, you're, if you're not thinking of Maniac Cop. But to me, this one's a classic. I mean, Joe Spinell, his performance alone is is what makes this movie watchable. He's so charismatic and so creepy. He's terrifying yet likable. It's, it's almost like, like American Psycho in a way, if American Psycho is actually scary and genuinely creepy. I mean, you've got this, this creepy fucking lunatic going around New York scalping women, um, usually going after hookers, and to make matters worse, he's putting them on mannequins and he's talking to them, and he's got this weird, like, mother complex about him. It's, it's fantastic. This is really not only one of the best slasher films, but one of the best horror films. It works as both. It works as a psychological horror film, and it works as a slasher film. And you've got great performances all across the board. You've got really, really spooky soundtrack. Um, <laughs> spooky soundtrack. Um, you've got um, really great effects from uh, Tom Savini on this one. He even kills himself in the film. He takes that epic shotgun blast to the face, uh, which which makes this one, and among other things in the movie, really memorable. It's Maniac is just fantastic, and if you haven't seen it, check it out. If you've already seen it, go back and watch it again. I know I do. Intruder. The one that everybody thinks Sam Raimi directed, except it was actually Scott Spiegel, who has worked very closely with uh, Sam Raimi and Ted and Bruce Campbell from the days of their Super 8 film days, from the days of the Evil Dead trilogy, and up until the, the Spider-Man films. So it's uh, no wonder why it feels like a Sam Raimi film. I mean, Sam Raimi himself is a character in the film, as is Ted Raimi, as does Bruce Campbell show up for about three minutes. But this one is great because it takes, I think, what might be everybody's worst fear is not only are you at work, you're on a graveyard shift, and there's a serial killer on the loose. And you're, in the, you're in the place that you least want to be, which is your fucking job, and somebody's trying to kill you. I mean, that in itself is a fantastic concept. Plus, you've got really likable characters in this one, got a nice twist at the end, and really, really good gore, really good stuff. Uh, this one is really one of my favorite ones to watch. Great atmosphere, great characters, 
really, really gory stuff, especially Ted's or is it Sam Raimi's death? I don't know. The two look the same, but definitely look out for this one if you haven't seen it. This one is great. <laughs> Burning, directed by Tony Malum, unfortunately written by Harvey Weinstein. This is something you'll have to get over. I mean, look, fine. He had a part in the screenplay, but Harvey Weinstein has been part of the, the horror genre for longer than any of us can really remember, if you think about it. I mean, Dimension Films, Miramax, The Weinstein Company, this put out a lot of, lot of horror stuff, and you can't really blame the distributor um, for the movies. I mean, he's, the movies that he has been responsible for are great, whether or not he had a big part in them or he was just a distributor. I mean, just recently, I was watching Gangs in New York with my girlfriend. And what do we notice? Executively produced by Harvey Weinstein. So don't let that sway you, because this is a pretty charming little movie with some brutally graphic gore effects. Again, Tom Savini, another slasher in it that very well, in my opinion, should be on the same tier as guys like old Jason. It's the Cropsy Maniac, the gross-looking burn victim who was a former camp counselor. The campers played a prank on him. They horribly disfigured him, and now he's back. He's back to get revenge on the camp and on the, I guess, the new generation of, of campers. I don't think he, I don't think any of the old campers that did it to him come back. Um, but this one's awesome, and it's got uh, one of the memorable, memorable parts for it for me is an early performance from Jason Alexander, George Costanza himself, uh, which I find um, adds adds to the charm of the film because I've always really liked uh, Jason Alexander. I've always really liked Seinfeld. And I kind of consider this to, in a weird way, be canonically affiliated with Seinfeld, even though the character's name is different. I, my alternate title for this film has always been um, The Summer George Lost His Smile. So effectively, the original Summer of George. Christine, because we had to have some John Carpenter in there, but I didn't want to be obvious about it. Oh, yeah, let's just do Halloween. Now, Christine is great. Um, this is one that I think a lot of people overlook, and it's a crying shame because it's an incredibly simple story about just the transformation of a character. The, the whole point of this movie is Arnie going from this meek, nerdy dude into what you, I guess, could describe as like an alpha male to a loathsome scumbag piece of shit. And it's basically him becoming this murderous car. And not only that, but you've got, in my opinion, one of John Carpenter's best film scores. I'm not sure if Carpenter himself performed this one or if it was Alan Howarth, but I love it. Like just the overall tone sets perfectly with the film. Um, it's not ultra graphic, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, that There's a scene where one of the bully characters gets like run over by Christine and the car's like on fire and it leaves him like laying burning in the street. That's such an effective scene. It goes by really quick, but it lingers in your brain. It, at least it did for me when I saw it on UPN back in like 1996. Reanimator. Of course, Reanimator. We had to have a little bit of Stuart Gordon in here. I, I decided to think about which one I was going to do. I know I've already done From Beyond on this show. I thought about doing Dagon, but fuck Dagon. We're going to do Reanimator. Jeffrey Combs, classic. Stuart Gordon, classic. H.P. Lovecraft movie, classic. Obviously not exactly like the story. They changed a lot. It's more of a modern setting kind of thing. But I swear to God, every time I watch... I watch, or no, every time I read Reanimator, thanks to the film, I picture Jeffrey Combs playing Herbert West, even though he's described quite differently. But this one is is a nice balance of of horror, of comedy. It, you can very well easily do it as a as a double feature with something like Evil Dead, because uh, it has some genuinely shocking moments. It has some genuinely funny moments. Great performances all across the board, especially from you know. Herbert West himself, Mr. Jeffrey Combs. Uh, it's that great scene where a uh, severed head tries to eat out Barbara Crampton. I think we can just leave it at that. Fantastic film. Face is starting to get taken over by exposure. Let's start running through these. Dead and Buried from 1981. Now, I debated whether or not to put this one on the list because I actually haven't had a chance to watch it again. So, I don't remember, like... 
great details about it, but I remember the tone. This is one that I saw a little while back. It was one that I used to revisit a lot more often, but I haven't revisited it in a while. But this is a special one. It, uh, it was advertised as from the creators of Alien. Uh, we bring a new terror to Earth or something like that. And that's um, kind of kind of half correct. I mean, it had nothing to do with Ridley Scott technically, but it had to do with the writers of Alien and Aliens, particularly Ronald Shushit and kind of Dan O'Bannon. Dan O'Bannon had a, a, a treatment or ideas for the movie, but I don't think they were actually used, and that caused a, a rift between the filmmakers. Um, but Stan Winston did the effects. Obviously, he did the effects work for Aliens, so it's it's half correct. Um, and if I'm if I'm remembering this movie correctly, it's this town full of dead people that anytime a, a new person comes into town, they kill them horrifically and bring them back to life, and they become oh the exposure's the exposure is a uh, really kicking my ass right now. I'm gonna have to move in a little closer, get closer to you guys. It's a town full of, full of dead people. They they kill new people that come in and they become part of the town's deadness um there's a scene particularly that i remember vividly in my mind of uh, this this horrible car accident victim who gets like a syringe shoved into his eye it's pretty awesome creep show two so we've got to do some underrated classics in here now and everybody raves about creep show one and you know what it's phenomenal the color is great it's got a great mix of uh, comedy and, and horror in, in general. Um, I've always loved the Crate. It was always one of my favorites. But something about Creepshow 2 always had me gravitate a little bit closer to that one. Creepshow 2, I've always felt, had a really sleazy vibe. It was a, a vibe of sleaze that I felt was superior to the first Creepshow. Um, something about the overall tone of the Hitchhiker segment, um, of the Raft segment, are just great. Even the... Um, I forget what the what the actual segment was called, but it was the uh, the wooden the wooden cigar store Indian that comes to comes to life and starts killing those uh, people that robbed the, the shop that it's from. Creepshow Two, I think, is very underrated um, and it has incredible rewatchability, at least in my point. And it's one that if you haven't seen it in a while, I would go back and revisit it because I think you might be pleasantly surprised by how good it actually is. Now, I was going to do Phantasm, but I realized that it's from 1979, so we're going to do Phantasm 2 because it's 1988. And you know what? Let's face it. Phantasm 2 is actually a lot better than Phantasm 1, at least in my opinion it is. Phantasm 1 is great. It's got this quaint, spooky kind of vibe to it, some really cool cinematography. It's a bit slow, but it's all atmosphere. Phantasm 2 is the exact opposite of this. It is a, a on-the-road monster hunting film. You get a lot more insight into the tall man even though you don't actually learn anything about him i think in the entire series in all all five films including ravager barely do much to actually explain who he is other than the fact that he's this old mortician that found a way uh to, to create a rift between the world of the living and the world of the dead he goes in he comes out as the tall man there's somehow like hundreds of copies of him he's got these metal sphere things that attach to your head and drain you of all your blood he crushes down people that, uh, that, that he kills um, into weird little ghouls. Phantasm's great. But Phantasm 2 takes place uh, a number of years after the first film. Mike is all grown up and he hits the road with the former ice cream vendor turned monster hunter to hunt down the tall man for basically murdering their entire family. And this one, the tall man is barely in it. It's more of like a looming presence, but I think that makes it kind of kind of creepier like you're always expecting uh angus scrim uh the tall man to show up and uh you're always seeing the the carnage left over from the next town of the bodies that he's taken from the cemeteries that's one of the, t the things the tall man does is he goes from town to town collecting all the dead bodies and turning people into robed ghouls for what reason i don't really know i think they tried to explain it in ravager Phantasm 2 is really cool. If you like road movies, it's great. Like monster hunting kind of stuff. I I also kind of feel like the show Supernatural probably ripped off Phantasm in a way because you've got these two. I mean, they're not brothers, but they're close friends driving like in an old 
uh, 60s or 70s muscle car, and they're hunting monsters on the road, and they're going from town to town uh, trying to, like, help people and save people. So, Phantasm 2. Fucking awesome. Ten years ago, on the night of October 31st, a small Midwestern town fell victim to an escaped killer. Under the cover of darkness, he carried out the most horrifying mass murder on record. 16 people in cold blood. Ever since that night, no one has forgotten his name. And Halloween has never been the same. Halloween 4, because let's do some more sequels. I've always felt this one was really underrated. I think people shit on the Halloween sequels a little too much. They're a bit too um, elitist when it comes to the first three. You know, the only ones worth watching are Halloween 1, 2, and, well, people shit on Season of the Witch, but I think more people probably like, well, maybe not, maybe because of the Michael Myers factor, more people like, more people like 4, but I digress. A lot of people shit on the sequels. I think this one doesn't deserve the shit that it gets. It's ages better than five. It's way better than six. Way the fuck better than H2O. It's way better than those jokes that Rob Zombie made. Um, Halloween 4 keeps a lot of the spirit of the first two. Michael Myers is, is this looming presence. Um, he somehow survived the explosion at Smith's Grove. Uh, no, it wasn't Smith's Grove. It was the Haddonfield Hospital at the end of Halloween 2. Somehow, neither him or Dr. Loonis were absolutely fucking obliterated into, like, little pieces. But whatever. Retconning a little bit. So what? It has a great vibe to it. Like, Halloween 4, to me, is all vibe, all mood. Um, I really... I really just enjoy the look of it. Uh, the feel of it, Michael Myers is a little more, a little more strong, a little more powerful in this one. Um, he's not quite as uh, like in the first two. He's he's kind of strong, but he doesn't seem as much like a like a powerhouse, I guess. In this one, he's like you'll you'll see him like manhandling people a little more often. But it it works. It worked for this one. It wasn't like getting a pro wrestler to play him like they did in the Rob Zombie one. I actually found it kind of interesting that they actually filmed this one in. Illinois, which I feel like really added to the film, um, especially in the opening credits. I love that where they're showing all the old farmland and uh, all the pumpkins and the scarecrows with that fucking creepy ass music playing. Um, the review for Halloween 4 here was a little bit rambly, but I don't have a script. So we're, we're just outside noises. I don't know how much of, of the noises out here this mic is actually picking up. This thing's actually pretty sensitive. Um, Hopefully this video doesn't sound like complete shit and hopefully hope that and hopefully you've enjoyed it. I'm going to go the fuck home now. Actually, no, don't go away quite yet because I wanted to do a little plug on a great documentary that's coming out about 80s horror films that I just may or may not be involved with, but I'm going to I'm going to share it anyway because my buddy Cecil of Good Bad Flex is a part of it. Uh, Brandon of Brandon's Cult Film Reviews, Cult Movie Reviews. He's the Godzilla guy. He's going to be in it. A bunch of other people, a lot of actors, a lot of directors. The likes of Jeffrey Combs are going to be in there. So check it out. Check out the trailer. What we got them to do? Finger licking good. It's showtime. I realize he must have gone through hell. Gone? Bitch, we still here! It's time for the grand finale! one of 
this. It's time to join the club. Monetary support, Patreon and merch. Links in the description. More quality entertainment? Catch me on Radio Drum with Josh Hadley and Cecil from Good Bad Flicks on 1201beyond.com. And be sure to check out some of the other shows. Support badass synthwave artists like Perturbator on bloodmusic.com. You have everything to lose, I have everything to gain. Man, imagine if I shot it like this. Fuck. <laughs>